Welcome to Refire These Times, the podcast bringing you conversations at the intersection of politics, culture, and the environment. I'm your host, Jabba Ayoub, and today we'll be talking to Anne Kresmer. She's a coordinator with the Stay Grounded Network, which works on a global level to reduce air traffic and build a climate-just transport system. They recently published a paper entitled A Rapid and Just Transition of Aviation, Shifting Towards Climate-Just Mobility, which was a big part of our conversation. As is usual with these episodes, we ended up talking about a number of things, from the social and environmental costs of airport projects to the problem behind carbon offsetting. We looked for alternatives, we talked about the issues, for example, with tackling tax exemption for aviation. We discussed how flying is already unjust, the problem of frequent flyers, the fact that it's a small percentage of the population, the global population that actually flies, etc, etc. Then we discussed Europe's lack of international booking for trains and how that's a big problem. We also discussed how trains are not necessarily the solution everywhere. For example, the Maya train project in Mexico is actually a big problem. And we sort of uh, delved into the wider question of asking a what kind of mobility do we need and want and how can we distribute it in a just way of course we're all dealing with COVID-19 we know that COVID-19 has already uh, deeply impacted the aviation sector so the idea is to look at how we can implement change by design rather than change by disaster we spoke about for example the Green New Deal for the Gatwick region in the UK we spoke about degrowth we spoke about alternative tourism the importance of intersectionality and the centrality of environmental justice and so on and so forth So, as I said, quite a lot of things were discussed. So this is the latest in a series of uh, episodes on the topic of environmental justice. There will be more to come in the future. So that's it from me, and thank you for listening. If you like what I do, please consider supporting this project with only $1 a month on Patreon or on buymeacoffee.com, and you can also do so directly on PayPal if you prefer. Patreon is for monthly, PayPal is for one hours, and Buy Me Coffee has both options. And if you cannot donate, you can still support this project by sharing with your friends and leaving a review wherever you get your podcasts. The music is by Torah Beat. Thank you. I'm Anna Kretschmer. Um, I've been working with the Stay Grounded Network for around two years now. And yeah, also for the last years, I've been quite active in the climate justice movement in Germany and um also involved in the debate of degrowth for some years i've been studying economics but yeah kind of critical alternative economics so where we're trying to rethink economics and see how we can um yeah how economic science should maybe serve better for the yeah for the people not for the profit so we'll start with we'll stay grounded since you like you you work with them. Uh, how how did the initiative come about and what does it try to to achieve? Yeah, sure. So um, stay grounded is an international network. Um, we have around one hundred seventy member organizations by now in um, yeah in five continents, and there are many members in Europe, like most of our members, but. Yeah, we also have increasing an increasing number of members in the global south, and our members are yeah NGOs, activist groups, grassroots, indigenous people that are resisting land grabbing for airport expansion. So a lot of different groups that have something to do with flying, mobility, airport expansion, resisting against that. And how the network came about was that in 2016, there were coordinated actions against the Corsia uh, scheme. So to explain that, that's the carbon offsetting and reduction scheme for international aviation. So basically, uh, yeah, a scheme to trying to uh, offset emissions from aviation. And there was a a resistance against that based on the idea that this is a false solution and we can't really offset emissions. And the people that organize those actions realize that there's actually not really a movement around aviation and that the problem is not addressed well. And um, there are no existing campaigns, so they started to organize and set up meetings and um, networked and yeah that was basically the initial start of this network um and um yeah so that was 2016 and then it became more formal and there were some um general principles like our 13 steps for um reducing aviation and reaching a climate just mobility were agreed on by yeah collective writing process 
And the Stay Grounded Network is working on many different levels. So on the one hand, we're trying to build a movement around the topic of um, the effects of aviation on the climate and on people um, and make that visible and shape the public discourse, bring it into the public discourse. And um, on the other hand, we try to show how everything is linked. So aviation is not the single problem, but aviation is in a way can be seen as one of the manifestations of our like economic growth capitalist system based on exploitation and extraction and everything faster and bigger and more and showing yeah how this is linked is one of uh, our um yeah let's say goals um and also, of course, we're trying to do solidarity work. So show the struggles of our members, make them visible for everyone. So um, yeah, if there is a, a group resisting airports in, um, in the Maldives, we, we try to make that visible to everyone and show, okay, it's not just about noise here in the airport, but once there's an airport built here, there's an airport built on the other side of the world and that's causing problems as well. So like to kind of just get into it, um, I, I would suppose, you know, most listeners would be like me prior to reading the reports. So like we know that aviation is a problem. We know we, we vaguely know about like emissions and of course it's a big deal. But what Stay Grounded is trying to do is not just point out the, the, this, which is like, I guess it's obvious to most people, but how does it also affect people? How does it also affect communities? What are the sort of structures that uh, prioritize the building of airports and expansions of airports? And what are like what are some ways to tackle that and and like deal? Uh, sorry, tackle that problem heads on. Okay, so first on the thing of most people know that I <laughs> I think. I maybe doubt it a bit because very often the problem of aviation is downplayed a lot and people are talking about ah it's just two percent of emissions but actually um, now recent studies found out that it's around six percent of climate heating comes from aviation and before COVID we had had this massive growth in aviation so um, meaning that yeah by 2050 we could have 20 per 25 percent of uh, global heating actually coming from aviation. So just to show that it's a bigger problem and includes also non-CO2 effects, which is also often not mentioned. Yeah, so that's just on the question of most people know. So yeah, it's downplayed a lot. Maybe optimistic um, on my part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but you're right, there is an increasing debate on that. And that's, I think it's, it's quite positive um, and yeah, on the question of what other effects it has apart from, from emissions. So um, I think so there are multiple factors. One is, of course, that um, airports are often mega projects that, um, uh, that come along with uh, re replacement of people. Communities lose their, their, their place where they live and their, um, um, their acres or whatsoever. It comes along with, of course, noise pollution, but then also we have effects that are a bit, yeah, let's say more indirect. So one thing is, uh, and they are also related to what I talked before, what I talked about before the, the problem of the false green solutions and the hope in technologies, because we have, for example, um, biofuels, and then there is the, there, um, that seems to be like an answer on using biofuels instead of kerosene. But then with biofuels, there are a lot of other problems that come along. So first of all, it might be a concurrence to, um, to food uh, when you plant crops for biofuels, that's one aspect, but it also very often comes along with land grabbing. So displacement of communities again, and the same uh, is also true for offsetting projects. So here you have, um, you have the idea that we can pay, like I'm, I'm flying, for example, and um, I'm aware of the mission, so I buy an offset to have some project paid to, um, yeah, to, the idea of offsetting is that you buy, um, 
um, you buy a way you you buy a ticket in a way to offset your emissions. But then what happens is that there are projects on the other side of the world, mostly because often it's people in the global north buying those offsetting um, and then projects in the global south. And those projects actually often also go along with land grabbing, with uh, people um, being um, not allowed to enter their local forests, for example. And this is very problematic because it's a kind of neo-colonialism where you think you can free yourself from the sins with just paying money and letting people on the other side of the world, yeah, offset your emissions. I don't know. Yeah, and I can I can give a concrete example of that. I was looking it up while, while you were talking. Uh, I live in Switzerland and recently, I believe it was in October, Switzerland struck the world quote unquote world first carbon offsetting agreement with with the government of peru and the idea is and i can just read out the the write-up here in an agreement that took two years to negotiate peru will get finance for sustainable development projects while switzerland takes credit for the emission cuts and it's that sort of of um business in some ways and that, that has i've been interestingly um concerned with of course it's, it's one of the legacies of the paris agreement one of the limitations many would say of the of the Paris agreements, my previous guests uh, were presenting the social um, societal transformation scenario, sorry, also made a critique on that point, which I will redirect to in the show notes. But yeah, so being based in Switzerland, kind of the link to my other question, um, it's a country that's pretty well connected by trains, uh, even though it's you know not always affordable, but connections between European countries aren't always the best and almost never cheaper than, than planes. Um, maybe, I, would, I don't want to limit our conversation only to Europe. It's just because I'm more familiar with the train system here. But what can be done to bridge that gap in your, in your view? And is it merely a matter of governments subsidizing certain means of transportation over others? And uh, yeah, as I said, I'm just focusing on Europe because I'm based here. But feel free to expand uh, using other examples as well. Yeah. Yeah, so what, uh, what Stay Grounded published recently is a report called Degrowth of Aviation. And there we lay out different measures to reduce aviation in a just way. And we actually discuss different measures because we say this discussion is not happening. So what we have at the moment is huge tax um, exemption for aviation. I mean, I live in Germany, so I know the numbers for Germany that we have around uh, 11 billion of uh, taxpayers money lost every year from uh, the fact that kerosene is not taxed and there are no there's no vat uh, vat on international flights so that's, that's really extraordinary huge, that's really, really a huge sum so of course this is totally a problem and it's absolute not understandable and unacceptable that kerosene shouldn't be taxed as other fuels uh, fossil fuels are but on the other hand this is of course, not the only solution just to tax kerosene. So in this report, we lay out different measures and we say, OK, there's taxing of kerosene, there's taxing of VAT. There may be also prices on tickets, um, but there are also limits. So we have to discuss also how to limit actually flights, to put absolute limits, to put moratoriums on airport expansions, because what we really don't need is more growth. We really need to, to put a limit. and. Um, we also discuss in which ways those measures are just because with price mechanisms like um, like a tax, you always you often have the problem that yes, you can lower the demand for that, but it can also mean that only the well-off can fly, and that's of course not a just solution. So um, when we actually look at the numbers of flights, we see that in itself flying is already very in unjust unjust because they're um like for example only one percent of the world's population causes 50 percent of commercial av um, aviation emissions so that's a huge amount it's really a small minority of frequent flyers that are responsible for the biggest share of this problem so when we use price mechanisms that uh, actually don't affect the ones who are very well off because they don't care anyway then that's not the solution so one of the uh, mechanisms, uh, yeah, one of the things we suggest is that we also talk about actual limits. 
because this will solve one of the problems. Um, we also talk about uh, a frequent flyer levy, which means that taxes increase with, with each flight you take. So the people that really fly very often, that tax much more than others and people that, that just take a flight every other year to maybe visit their families on another country. Um, yeah, they're taxed less. Um, and um, I think what is also important in this is that we need actually a discussion about what are necessary flights and what are not. Because in the end, um, if we limit flights, we have to talk about this, right? And this is not an easy, I think it's not an easy discussion, but we need it because like for me personally, there's no reason to fly. I, will, I don't miss it, I don't need it. But there might be people that have, uh, um, have had the need to fly, flee from their country. And then of course they need to maybe visit their families abroad. And I, of course, I don't see a reason to forbid that or to make it extremely expensive or difficult for them. And there might be also for emergency reasons needs to fly, but there's no need for a shopping trip to Paris. So those discussions are needed, I think. And on the other hand, we need also very practical and straightforward solutions, which is, of course, supporting better railway systems. In Europe, um, we have a big problem that there's no international booking. So in, when you want to go from one country to another by train, you have really problems getting your train rate insured. You sometimes have to book three trains um, through three system, um, different systems. And there are a lot of initiatives that actually work on this, like Back on Track or We Autant de Nuit, a French group, or also Erasmus by Train, a student group that tries to, to bring forward the idea of going to your Erasmus by Train. And yeah, so there are initiatives working on that. And some things are moving on the question of night trains. But there have been a lot of mistakes in the in the past decades with um, with really uh, destroying in a way the railway system we had. And then on the international level, um, I I would say there are also examples of um, of good train systems. Like in India, there is a very good train system that connects most most regions. In other countries, there are very good coach systems. But um, I think we, what we also experience uh, in the network and where we are very happy to have this variety of um, perspectives is that you always have to look at the local situation. Like for example, now one of our members in, um, in Mexico is resisting um, the Maya train that is being built there. So there we can also say not every train is good. This is a very, like the Maya train is a very intrusive infrastructure project that is actually threatening the community there and it's just built for mass tourism and for profit and not really for a just mobility. So we always look have to look at the local um, local situation and coming back to your question of um, yeah of whether this is just a matter of government subsidizing certain means of transport over other no it is not. It is also, so we do need different measures. We do need the uh, end of those tax exemptions, but we also need the discussions about what kind of mobility do we need? What kind of mobility do we want and how can we distribute it in a just way? Yeah, thank you for that and, and for the, the, the correction as well. Um, the, the, the emphasis is on just mobility, you know, and it's sort of like the new, um, I don't know if I would call it trend, but like it's definitely in a new awareness in the climate movement of focusing on environmental justice, on social justice issues in general. And I'll, I'll preface that question, the question I have on like, if you can expand on what does just look like, like what, what are some examples of that? I'll preface it by just reading um, a bit of the paper here, uh, and I'm quoting here. It cannot be an option anymore to use taxpayers' money for bailing out polluting airlines, airports, and related manufacturers. Instead, recovery packages must be directly used to finance a just transition for a living wage and social protection for workers leaving the industry, restraining programs, the creation of jobs in climate safe sectors, and for fostering alternatives to flights and mass tourism. Public money must save people, not planes. So can you sort of expand from that, uh, essentially, what, what, what does it really look like for those who may not be familiar? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so this is uh, a quote from our rec most recent publication, the uh, discussion paper on just transition of aviation. So here the just aspect is about what do we actually do when we transform from one sector to another? Because of course, when we demand less aviation, that means a loss of uh, a loss. It might mean a loss of jobs, and we're always confronted with this topic because in some regions, airports um, and airlines are um, a very um, yeah are, are the ones giving the jobs to people. So and there, of course, we. Um, we, we want to, we don't want to work against workers. Um, so the idea, like the, the demand for a just transition has been developed by trade unions and climate justice movement together. And the idea is that uh, protecting workers and communities currently depending on fossil fuel, fuel industry doesn't mean only protecting jobs, but it means also to bring forward a process that yeah that safeguards long-term security and the future of the workers and the planet and often we have this argument that um, we need to protect jobs and by that like that this is used to delay the changes needed and the idea of a just transition we want to manage these changes effectively and fairly and democratically so a very important uh, part of this just transition, I think, is that the whole process includes um, a social dialogue with workers and communities at all stages. So it's not something imposed from above, but it's really done in dialogue. And um, on the other hand, it must also be rapid because the longer the transition takes from the fuel based uh, industry, the more unjust and difficult it will be because the effects of climate crisis won't wait and they will also be very unjust. So those are the two aspects I think we need to uh, look at here. Um, and yeah, the principles. So in our, um, um, in our paper, we wrote down, um, we tried to formulate some principles um, of the just transition and they are providing social protection is the first one. And this should be in a broader context of supporting livelihoods. So ne not necessarily this one job, but the livelihood it itself of the people, of the workers and their families, that they can meet their basic needs, also during time of unemployment, um, and that trainings are provided. And the second um, principle would be promoting the creation of alternative employment. So really see, okay, where what is the skill of that worker? Um, and where in which other sector could they go, which other sector is available in that region or close by that could um, be, yeah, where this, the skill could be used. And then also uh, an aspect is investing in, in skills development and retraining. So offer this and pay that um, people are retrained and can develop new skills. Um, one aspect would be also to halt new training and employment in aviation because we don't, we would say that we don't need new growth, new uh, training in aviation, but need the transition. And um, but one important part is also the global support for just transition. So look at the global scale of this aspect. So uh, that means that we need substantial financial support for global south countries from historic emitters so that also here we have the justice aspect from the north to the south and i think um because maybe we didn't make that clear in the beginning that this paper or this idea is especially so important now at the moment because we actually do have already a downscaling of aviation through COVID-19 and so that's also how we came to make this discussion paper because we say okay people are losing their jobs now and and we need an answer to that we do have in the degrowth um in the deep growth debate we often talk about change by design or by disaster and what we have now through COVID is a change by disaster so people are actually laid off from their jobs they uh, they lose it. they don't have a protection of their livelihood 
And with this stress transition paper, we say, okay, hang in here. Now we need to see how we can protect those workers, but at the same time, transition them to other sectors. Because if we don't do that, the next crisis, the climate crisis will hit and in and um, endanger them and their livelihoods again. Yeah, thanks a lot for that. Um, and it's very important because this has generally been a weakness in the climate movement in the past. And, you know, we can think of the coal miners in, in, in America and it, it was at least partly, it wasn't necessarily the main thing, but it was partly one of the factors that allowed Trump to appeal to a certain segment of the population there by, you know, appealing to the return to the mines and, and that sort of thing. And I did feel even speaking recently that there hasn't really been a very vocal uh part of the climate movement or like progressives or others who would say like we we do there, there is a genuine concern there there are actual people losing their jobs it's not something that can be just ignored and it is important to obviously tackle that question because if we don't tackle that question well someone else is going to tackle that question in a much worse way you, so there is an example actually we we mentioned in the pre-chat an example i think it was in limburg netherlands can you can you mind expanding from that um yeah so there there are some examples um actually in the coal sector we mentioned one in our transition uh paper um about the netherlands where they had a coal mine close where they closed the coal mine and seventy thousand jobs got lost but the government provided subsidies for new businesses and relocated industries from the capital to the impacted regions and provided training so there are some uh, some examples of of that in in the sector of coal. Often, however, there it's for transitioning to gas. So I'm not sure about whether that's actually the solution. But um, maybe if we want to talk about one example, I I would really like to to give the example that um, is not implemented yet, but is an is a yeah. Um, is a could proposition. Be a very good. Mm. Yeah, a, a proposition could be a very good example for um, a just transition in aviation, and that's um, the idea of the Green New Deal for Gatwick. So what they did here, and what actually is in a way the next step from our just transition paper, to be very concrete, they did a. Um, so Gatwick is the second biggest, largest airport in in UK. And it's very hardly hit by the COVID-19 crisis um, with the loss of, of job losses and the highest un unemployment rate currently. And what they did is an analysis of the situation and attempt the dependency of jobs in the area on the airport and see how, like lay out how this dependency is unhealthy and also given the prospected development of the aviation sector, because we now see that even the aviation industry itself says, okay, it will take a lot of years to get back to, to business as before. And then they're showing how current reactions and bailouts fail, bailouts fail to protect workers and livelihoods, because what we saw in the last year was a lot of, bill, a lot of money, like billions of money going to the industry in bailouts that actually didn't was not um, that actually didn't secure livelihoods and workers because it was not there were no binding conditions to which social like no binding social or environmental conditions. So this report is showing how the government actually failed to do something here. And then they're analyzing the existing skills in the region, acknowledging that people also feel attached to their work and the industry, and they're laying out the sectors where those skills could be used elsewhere with a concrete examples showing direct job creation potential and then giving numbers what this could cost and how it could be financed and so they're doing this very specific for Gatwick region and I think this is a, this is a really great thing and this is what we need to do in in the region and um, it's really gaining track um, traction with the local authorities now it's being discussed there I mean I don't know how promising it is that something really will change but we're having conversations here about the potential implementation and I guess that that's a really positive example um, and yeah maybe another example that to me was very inspiring was even though it was it's not directly um, got towards the 
yeah, was not an, a direct success uh, was the Lucas plan from the Lucas Aerospace um, uh, company in the UK, which in the 70s um, was threatened by uh, a lot of, yeah, the workers were, were threatened to be uh, laid off and to defend their jobs, they proposed an alternative socially useful applications of the uh, company's technology. So they sat together with unionists and they said, okay, what can we with our skills produce that is socially useful, has a social benefit that actually, that we actually need for our society. And to me, this is very inspiring because here you have workers that sit there and say, okay, we are made redundant. Actually, nobody needs what we're producing here. So we sit together and we think, okay, what can we do with our skills? What does society really need? And yeah, so that, that's a really inspiring example for me and how this just transition should actually happen. A lot of the discussions that we've heard like around COVID-19 and, and just in the past year or so, when we say like the big symbolism of how we want things to go back to normal is a return to pre-COVID tourism, essentially. There's a lot of, you know, of course, the images of, you know, Paris being empty or London being empty, whatever, all of that. Of course, that that's shocking and dramatic. But um, a lot of the discussion, even to this day, uh, I do I do agree that there's definitely some change. You know, the Green New Deal for Gatwick is a good example of how there's this, this increased awareness of we can't actually go back to pre-COVID-19 numbers. This pre-normal wasn't really normal, et cetera, et cetera. So like... When we talk about tourism, for example, when we talk about you know British tourists always going to the to Spain or even larger, you know British tourists always going to America or vice versa, what what have you? What are some ways of tackling that also heads on, like local tourism, you know, et cetera, et cetera? Because in the same way as the aviation industry or workers in the aviation industry are being impacted and will be impacted, of course, with climate change and so on, um, a lot of regions of Europe, of Asia, of so many segments of the world are dependent on tourism. So what are ways of doing it, not just quote unquote sustainable tourism that's not really sustainable, you know, the offset issues that you mentioned before and so on, but maybe more actual, you know, palpable ways like local tourism and, and so on, if that makes sense. Mm. Yeah, it totally makes sense. And it's part of our, I mean, it's not the focus, but for sure part of uh, this discussion paper that of course tourism is um, is very strongly connected with aviation and uh, um, yeah and there's also a sector hit very hard by um, by COVID-19 mm, and I mean we were in Stake Grounded we were talking with our members about this already pre-COVID we had in 2019 we had a conference on degrowth of aviation in Barcelona and there we worked together with uh, a lot of local groups and movement that are actually fighting the tourism and its effects in Barcelona and there I think we we saw very clearly how over tourism can have so many bad effects on a city and the communities living there Absolutely. because it's it's pushing the prices uh, a lot you, people can't afford to live in their own city anymore. They're living kind of in a museum. They're pushed out of, of the centers. Everything is made uh, only for tourists. The big ferries um, are destroying the um, environment um, environment of the port. And yeah, the um, and there we we wrote some articles together with those local initiatives and actually in Barcelona we also have some positive examples of um, um, of yeah resistance against this so they started to to limit the numbers of tourists they started to put um, to limit their Airbnb um, um, flats that could be offered and and trying in a way to give the city back to the locals and now with COVID we have also I think in Spain this discussion is going on for some time and uh, also now we had um, a statement from the union CCOO so the workers commission it's the largest trade union in Spain together with environmental organizations urging for 
yeah, a diverse tourism that is directed more to the countryside, not only to the capital, and that um, that's focused to, to have tourism for people close to where they live, so that not uh, tourism of very long distances. And that is not dependent on aviation and that is more connected with cultural and artist heritage and sustainable outdoor sports. And so this is also to me a very promising uh, teaming up of uh, unions and um, environmental movement. Um, and of course, globally, you, this question is even bigger because you have whole um, nations dependent, depending on on tourism and it's not an easy question it's of course also not a uh, question that you can solve immediately because you have those dependencies and it's not a solution that has to take away the tourism for good and then of course people depend and their livelihood depend on it but now with covid we see what happens when if one region or one country it, or people are totally dependent, like a monoculture of tourism in a way, dependent on tourism, because then it's not sustainable in a way of long, like, yeah, securing long lasting secure security mm -hmm. um, of livelihoods. And there, I think we need programs that actually support countries to um to go back maybe or go back or go forth to a more diverse local economy that is not dependent on foreign tourism because like that you always depend from other countries and i think that's um that is really difficult so one of our um uh, one of our steps within at stay grounded of our 13 steps towards uh, just uh, mobility is also um, an economy of short distances, which means that economy is, yeah, that we try to change our economy more to local economy and support that instead of being dependent on this far distance economy that we have now. Yeah, right. so it's, it's another example of uh, preferring change by design rather than change by, by, by disaster. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think through COVID we have a lot of disaster now. <laughs> you yes. see this everywhere, and I think the um, yeah the challenge is really to make at least at least a little bit of design out of it and learn for it from future cri for, for further crises and not um, yeah not just go back to business as usual and then we'll have the next crisis and the same problems will appear. Yeah, absolutely. So can you please talk a bit more about uh, how the paper was, and I'm quoting here, a collective writing process by people active in the climate justice movement, workers in the aviation sector, trade unions, indigenous communities, and academics from around the world, end quote. You already mentioned this, of course. Um, I will sort of say that I have a number of uh, indigenous groups uh, that I will be interviewing in the future, but they're not confirmed yet, so I can't plug them yet. But it is what like even that sentence alone, you know, that that intersectionality, we might say, it, it's one of the signs that uh, to me indicates, um, well, it indicate when I read that in the paper, it indicated that this is something that's different from some of the previous models that sort of don't look at the social aspect. You know, one of the critiques of the climate uh, movement up until fairly recently, we should say, and it's not, um, you know, the Green New Deal is the Sunrise Movement, Fridays for Futures, all of those things. Those are indications of the new ways of doing things. But we still have in many, many sectors, uh, big NGOs that still apply the old way of doing things, uh, which tends to ignore local economies and local workers and so on. So can you talk a bit more about that, like that, the, the intersectionality of it all and why that's so crucial? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I think what you just mentioned is, is it's really key and it's something that, the, the, in my opinion, the climate justice movement has really to put a strong focus on, on this justice question, because we will get nowhere if we just reach 1.5 degrees, but in a very unjust and uh, exploitative way. And there's a possibility for that. I think a lot of green solutions are leading us directly there. So what we have to really really strongly put an emphasis on as climate justice movement is this justice aspect and for that we need the people affected by that and so yeah for us it was natural only to be in dialogue with workers and unions when we want to talk about just transition and um 
Luckily, we do have in our network also progressive unions like the PCS, Public and Commercial Services Union in UK. So um, in general, I would say that in our one of the advantages of our network is that we have um, a broad range of members from very different fields. So we really do have this expertise already within our network. So when we write via our list, we have really a range of of perspective and, and, and opinions. And so we tried to use that. We started with an open brainstorming with everyone who's interested. Um, or yeah, maybe going back a bit, we had the Safe People Not Planes campaign when the first bailout started. And we said, okay, we need to link any bailouts to social and environmental conditions. And then we actually realized, okay, no government is doing that. And we said, okay, maybe it's even not the solution. We don't need bailouts going to the industry at all. We actually need bailouts or any money going really into recovery funds or yeah, into, into rescuing livelihoods, protecting livelihoods and not planes and the industry. And so we started with this open brainstorming within our network. We had an online discussion with inputs from trade unionists, from pilots, from, from an activist from the Dominican Republic who brought in this tourist, this question of tourism only also um, and how it's interconnected with aviation. Um, and after that webinar, we, and the brainstorming process, um, we took in a lot of variety of literature on just transition and the first draft was made by a working group that consisted of those different people. Um, and then we had various feedback loops within the network, um, trying to take in as many opinions as possible. And yeah, I think one of uh, the thing that that was really helpful in this that were, was that we had also, that we have uh, close contact with this group called Safe Landing, so a group of critical aviation workers, as they call themselves, the people who formerly worked in the aviation industry or even still work there. Some of them were made redundant or decided themselves they don't want to work there anymore and now are now active in the climate justice groups or movement. And this was very important to have their input because they have the insight from the industry and can say, okay, this is where the problems lay. This is where the industry is doing greenwashing. This is where people are really um, relying on jobs. And then we had the unionist perspective, of course, that also takes into account all those um uh yeah all those opinions of, of the workers and um one of our one a very active member of ours is um uh, indigenous a group of indigenous people in mexico who always um uh, contribute a lot to our publications um, who are resisting the airport in in mexico valley there and they also inputted on this question of Global South perspective and um, tourism dependency on tourism and the protection of indigenous communities and their rights. So um, yeah, that's maybe how this process went. And it was also a clear, uh, a clear decision to call the thing a discussion paper because we didn't want, and I think that's also an important aspect for the climate justice movement not to go there with ready solutions but we say okay this is what we think and um, this is the options we see and let's discuss this now and i think that's what is the next step now what needs to happen now and what is happening that in the different countries i mean it was translated into many languages the paper that now we start really having discussions with the local unions with the workers saying okay those are our ideas. What do you think? What do you need? What can we do together? How can we join forces? Um, yeah, where do you see the problems? And thank you for also mentioning the critical aviation workers. I didn't actually know of that term before. Um, it sort of belies in some ways, or at least it contradicts the the narrative that we usually see that it's it's all a matter of like either we protect jobs or we save the environment and those are the only two options usually given to us obviously by by politicians um and lobbies etc who are invested in these things um 
sort of related to that on, on the website, you share a, I think it's called airport related injustice and resistance map. Uh, that was very interesting for me to see. Can you can you sort of just explain what that map shows? And obviously, I will link all of this in the, in the descriptions. Yeah, this is a project um, we do together with the Environmental Justice Atlas. And um, we have around the globe uh, a lot of new airport projects, and they often involve land acquisitions, destruction of ecosystems, displacement of people, local pollution, health issues. And more and more airports, especially in the global south, are also becoming so-called aerotropolis, so airport cities that are surrounded by commercial and industrial development, hotels, shopping cities, logistics centers, whatever you need. And this is also, um, yeah, this is then a special economic zone. And coming back to the tourism question before, this is exactly what we don't need for to support local economy, because then you have this metropolis for the airport. People fly there, they go shopping there, and they go back, and no, no money is actually, yeah, is actually going to the country yeah. itself. Right. So together with the Environmental Justice Atlas, we identified more than. 300 airport related environmental justice conflicts in a research project and more than 70 are already mapped in in-depth case studies and yeah this mapping process is collaborative um, some cases have been handed in by local initiatives others have been mapped by a research team and we are currently working on a new interactive feature map on aviation where viewers can yeah delve even more into the into the topics and the injustices related to aviation by activating different cartographic layers providing country based information or, or something like that um, and yeah to us uh, the solidarity and the publicity and press work we do as network for communities threatened by airport and airport related projects is very important because yeah it shows this complexity of the problem it's not only about noise or emissions but it's about many more things and just to give a very recent example right now this week uh, while we're talking basically um, in Via Nazaré in a small town next to Porto Alegre in Brazil we have the German company Fraport who's, uh, who's driving the eviction of the last remaining families there because they're building um, a new runway or have an extension of the runway of the local airport. So here we have an international company, company that, is, that is evicting local people, threatening their livelihoods and not giving them the rights or, yeah, that they, um, yeah, not giving them their rights, but displacing them to build an airport. Yeah, thanks for that. And before I forget, I would also say that the the, recent, the discussion paper you mentioned is put forward in is is available in in a number of languages. And I would urge listeners who are able to translate to check uh, stay hyphen grounded dot org. The link again will be in the description to see if their language is missing and whether they can contribute to to expanding into other languages as well. Um, yeah, that's a really that's a really great idea. We do also have. Uh, volunteer pools for translation because we often yeah. need translation and we will be very happy for people sharing this discussion paper in the local context also giving us examples of where maybe transition is going on just transition more yeah awesome so like is there anything that uh, you'd like to discuss that i missed before we go on to the book section of this episode <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, there's probably a lot uh, that we can oh, yeah. continue to talk about uh, in this topic. I, yeah, I, I think um, we already got through a lot of the topics, and um, yeah, the discussion, the discussion thing is really important to me. Let's let's discuss about that and see where are solutions. How can we join forces to really transform this crisis? and make something out of it, go out of it um, in a just way, transform our tr society, and in this case, our mobility system in, in, a, in a just way that is not 
um, on the back of, of workers and on the back of, of the planet. Absolutely. So I, so we're entering the book section now. I'll ask you to, to uh, just recommend three books that you've enjoyed and that you might feel are, are you know, just go for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I think one, one book that was really inspiring to me or one author also is, is Emma Goldman, so an anarchist uh, from the 19th, 20th century and her book Vision on Fire, or which is actually a collection of her writings about the Spanish Revolution. And there you also have this question of working, taking over, workers taking over their, uh, um, their companies and reorganizing themselves. So that, that's really inspiring to me. And another one is um, Reimagine Change from Patrick Rainsborough and uh, Carl Donnan from the um, Center of uh, um, Strategy Based, oh, I forgot the exact name, but Story Based Strategy, that's it. So it's about how important are narratives for, um, for our uh, for our fight, for our struggles, and how we need to um, to have a vision of where we're going to. Um, yeah, and the last one is maybe actually not a book, but a very small uh, clip. It's called Years of Repair, A Message from the Future. It's from The Intercept and The, the Leap, and it's to me a very, um, very inspiring and encouraging video because it shows in a way how we could rebuild our society from the ground up after we go went through all of the struggle that COVID-19 means and it's a story of yeah of a lot of struggle but also a lot of solidarity and a lot of work that actually comes from this crisis. And I, I will say that uh, Years of Repair was partly designed by Molly Crab Apple uh, she's a good friend of mine, and she was a guest on on this podcast as well to talk about her. Um, well, speaking of Emma Goldman, slightly adjacent topic on like the Yiddish uh, Bundist movement at the time and that sort of thing. So I'll I'll take advantage to to plug that episode. It was quite fun to do. Um, well, and thanks a lot for your time. Uh, this has been you know a very dense and compact conversation, which I hope listeners will also agree with me. And I will do my best to include all of the links and get a bit info in the usual blog post on the website and in the description. Yeah, thank you very much. these times is made possible by supporters on patreon if you'd like to support through a monthly donation you can head out to patreon.com slash fire these times if you want to explore other options you can do so by checking out the website